This is a KX News special report. Good afternoon, North Dakota. Uh, welcome in to today's coronavirus press briefing. Uh, before we get to today's uh, case count, uh, I want to walk through some other uh, data which might be useful uh, for all North Dakotans as we think about where North Dakota stands uh, in our uh, battle uh, against uh, this deadly virus. Uh, the first uh, thing I'd like to take a look at is uh, uh, North Dakota positive test case rate. Uh, we know that in uh, states uh, where they've got dealing with uh, shortage of hospital capacity and uh, you know rising death counts, uh, that's correlated uh, to a high percentage of positives. In the case of the states uh, that you, we all, uh, our hearts go out to those states that are dealing with this right now, but whether it's uh, the New York metro area, including New York and New Jersey, New York's at about a 40% uh, positive uh, of people testing positive out of all the tests taken. New Jersey, 46%, uh, Michigan, 34%. Uh, Louisiana is uh, also climbing. Uh, but here we are in North Dakota with a 3.1% uh, test rate and we're the third lowest, only Alaska and Hawaii, which have got some also some natural geographic advantages the way uh, North Dakota does, um, you know, put us in that spot. So that's good news in terms of where we are. It means we're still early uh, in our battle. Every state will likely hit a point where there's an increase in their curve. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, so for us, uh, we've got a lo longer, longer uh, march ahead of us. We've stayed at this rate between 2.2 uh, and 3.2 percent on a rolling average uh, over the last three weeks. Uh, but on every given day, it may bounce around a little bit. Uh, and we know that uh, if you run the numbers for today, the positives today relative to the test today, it's at 4.2 percent. That's not a cause of major concern, but we're going to continue to track this number closely, uh, which is this, uh, the number of positive, the positive rate per testing. And, and then others might say, well, well, gee, well, maybe you've got a low positive test rate because you're not doing enough testing. Uh, but in fact, as we know from those of you who've been at these briefings for the past three weeks, uh, North Dakota has been committed to being on the front edge of testing, and we continue, uh, even as the uh, the nation pours resources towards the hot spot in terms of testing resources, uh, we are one of the states that's done extremely well uh, in terms of testing uh, that's uh, Overall, uh, we're the 10th best so far in terms of tests per capita, almost nine per capita. And we're, all, we're really leading among those states that haven't had a breakout. Now, when we take these two together, the, the uh, number of percent of positive cases and the amount of testing, uh, you'd want to be in the upper right-hand quadrant of this, this graph, which is where North Dakota is. The higher you are to the top of this graph uh, means the, lo the lower your percentage test rate. So only Alaska and Hawaii are states that are closer to the top of this graph. Uh, states that are to the right of us on this graph uh, include states like New York, where an enormous amount of federal resources have been supplanting the state effort uh, to try to get as many people tested as positive. And so this is, a, a, again, reflects that we're in a good spot today, and it means that we've got good information uh, to help guide us. We don't have perfect information. The data on testing is always lagging. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainty that's out there, uh, and we know that uh, the virus continues to spread in our state. We know how it spreads. Uh, and so we're, again, we're, we've said all along that we're, you know, well positioned and we've got more time to continue our preparation so we can be well positioned and well prepared so the public can have confidence uh, in how we're approaching this. But it doesn't mean that we can take our eye off the ball in terms of our, our, our strategy, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish uh, in terms of saving lives in North Dakota. The the test numbers for today, uh, there were 18 positives uh, for today that, that came uh, through out of 426 tests. Uh, we'll include in a minute some of the updates of our drive-through testing that we did in rural western North Dakota uh, this uh, past weekend. Uh, but what this uh, information does do is uh, take us to a number which people tend to focus, focus on, which is the uh, 225 uh, confirmed 
cases. But on this slide, I want to make sure again, uh, we're also focusing on the, the sort of the lime green, the recovered uh, portion of this, because when we uh, net out uh, those that have recovered off of this list, uh, we get a much a smaller number, and that's uh, something that we want to also pay attention to in our reporting. Because in terms of our healthcare system, we're which we're trying to protect, we're only managing the active cases. Uh, as far as a strategy, again, a slide that everybody's familiar with in terms of flattening the curve, uh, and we're trying to both two things: trying to flatten the curve, uh, and we're working to raise the hospital capacity. When we keep those two lines apart, the area under the blue, uh, keep that flattened down and the green uh, line on this slide, uh, keep that moving up, which we're doing. Uh, then we can assure that we can provide the best possible care for the most number of people. And that's what's gonna allow us to save lives in North Dakota. And when we talk about slowing the spread, uh, we're, we, we, this is what we're doing, we're slowing the spread. We're not eliminating the virus, we're just slowing the spread of the virus. And when we slow the spread of the virus, that means that again, our curve is flatter, but it may mean that some of the, the restrictions that we have may be, uh, also have to be in place longer. Uh, but one of the key things we're trying to really keep an eye on, because there have been a lot of calls uh, for, for us to be more restrictive uh, in our guidelines or in our mandates. And one of the key things we're, we want to make sure we're managing, because the key way to, for all these strategies, the strategies of, uh, of slowing the spread uh, and, you know, the, and then the, uh, the mitigation and then the containment, the key thing is, in the end of the day is hospital capacity. And we have shared uh, some of those numbers before, uh, but we wanted again really highlight uh, for all North Dakotans, uh, for everybody to understand that yes, there of the cases we've had, 32 of them have required hospitalization. Uh, only 19 of those are still uh, hospitalized today. And you know we're working to really uh, nail down the exact, exact numbers uh, in terms of uh, hospital bed capacity in North Dakota across three tiers, uh, tier one, tier two, tier three, uh, which would take take uh, tier one and tier two would be uh, hospital capacity that we could, tier one is what's available today, tier two is what is available within the existing walls of our medical facilities when we convert every possible space to hospital use and tier three is when we would get into the field hospital situation. But just uh, in tier one and tier two, uh, there's a uh, strong understanding that we could get to 2,600. So if I can pull that slide back up again on the hospital beds, uh, 2,600 beds, and we are using 19 today, uh, again, for everyone to uh, you know, take a breath and, uh, and understand that if what we're trying to manage against in terms of hospital capacity, we, we are clearly one of the states that remains in the very best position because you do these two numbers, 1% of 2,600 is 26. We're, we've got 99% of our potential hospital capacity still available uh, in our state uh, if we had to pull out every stop and use every single bed for COVID. So, so far, uh, we're again, uh, well positioned. Uh, one thing, uh, Sadly, uh, in today's re report, we did since our 11 o'clock, all these numbers are through the 11 o'clock. Uh, to date, we're gonna continue to report for the prior day. So these are Sunday's numbers reported as 11 o'clock this morning. But since 11 o'clock this morning, uh, we have had a confirmation. The family has been notified. Uh, so we're sharing today um, another death that will be included in tomorrow's numbers. Uh, the man was in his 70s, he was from Emmons County. Uh, he acquired uh, COVID-19 uh, through community spread. He had underlying health conditions, but of course from the, uh, the first lady and myself and all of us here uh, at Team ND, our hearts go out to his family and friends uh, and all, of his, all that knew him uh, for the loss of their, their loved one. Uh, in the weeks ahead, uh, we're going to talk more days and weeks ahead. We'll be back up here talking in more detail uh, about our hospital surge plan and the three tiers. Uh, so you'll hear more about in the coming days. Our team worked diligently, multiple meetings on Saturday and Sunday, uh, both at the state level and with uh, our providers around the state to make sure we've got a, a, a coordinated and thoughtful plan uh, when that when we start to get to that point where the cases are climbing, uh, that we're gonna be ready to deliver a, a coordinated uh, uh, healthcare uh, response. Uh, when we uh, 
to do that and to make sure that we keep uh, our great progress going, uh, we have to make sure that we're really uh, following all of our ND Smart recommendations. And of course, that's about staying home, staying healthy, and staying connected. Connected. When you take a look at the, the CDC or the White House recommendations, uh, which we've adopted uh, either as, as guidance or as executive orders, uh, recommending that everyone in the state uh, follow those, which again, uh, we want you to avoid crowds and social gatherings of more than, than 10 people. Uh, I want to just take a double click on that. Uh, we continue to hear anecdotal information uh, from around the state uh, of of gatherings, whether it's house parties, uh, whether it's church services, uh, whether it's uh, other informal gatherings where people are not taking that limit seriously. Uh, we wanna make sure that, uh, that people do. Uh, we'll continue to monitor this with input from mayors and county commissioners and the public. Uh, we, other states have gone to executive orders uh, to, uh, to turn that into a mandate. Uh, we're again, uh, asking uh, the public and uh, you know public and public leaders to reinforce the message about the importance of this to stop the spread and I know that uh, people are well intentioned uh, in terms of their gatherings but uh, whether it's for social purposes or something they might think is incredibly important I know many families have had to make the very very difficult decision of postponing funerals but as I said, one of the you know one of the big hotspot outbreaks in Eastern Canada came from a group of people that all attended a funeral, and so we have to be uh, uh, have to be careful. We have to think about you know the cultural challenges this pre presents for us because whether it's a, a Scandinavian culture, tribal culture, uh, all the different diverse cultures in our state uh, with, at times of need is when people wanna come together. That's when they wanna be with each other. They wanna give each other a hug. They wanna support. You wanna bring over the hot dish. Uh, someone's ill, you wanna come and visit them. That's what we've always done. Uh, and, and again, part of that culture we have to resist because that culture doesn't match up with how rapidly this virus can spread and how contagious this virus is and how this is deadly, particularly for people that are elderly with underlying health conditions. As we've said, this is not the flu. This is 15 times more uh, deadly for people with underlying health conditions, which include di diabetes, uh, you know, heart disease, uh, obesity, other, other chronic health diseases, uh, this can have a higher mortality rate. And again, as we've gone through, we're not talking about a few people in North Dakota. We're talking about over 20% of the population of North Dakota would fall into that category of the few folks that are considered most vulnerable. Another is uh, washing your hands. Again, I know that uh, people have become better at washing their hands uh, and, and disinfecting surfaces. But again, uh, if you're going in, if you're saying, hey, I'm out doing essential work and I'm going to the grocery store and I'm touching the door handle, going into that grocery store and a hundred other people have touched it, you've got to wash your hands or use disinfectant or you could be one of the mechanisms of community spread uh, that could literally be passing the infection to someone else and it may have no effect on you, could be deadly to them. Uh, and so again, uh, avoiding travel, uh, non, no non-essential trips or social visits. Uh, we're gonna be talking more about visitations uh, to nursing homes today and uh, regarding uh, uh, or the importance of keeping, uh, keeping uh, and protecting our most uh, elderly people. Uh, those of you that are supporting our restaurant community, again, thank you for using drive throughs and curbside at restaurants. Uh, work from home wherever possible. We know that's not possible for people in our ag uh, community. If you're in spring calving, uh, if you're getting an itch and getting ready, I know it's too wet for most everybody and too early to be in the field, but I know that a lot of the people with agronomy and grain elevators and feed suppliers have instituted uh, instituted very responsible practices such as when people are coming they've got their order already set out uh, for them to pick up or don't get out of your don't get out of your uh, cab when you're going through if you're dumping grain in the driveway at an elevator uh, stay in your vehicle again there's a lot of very pragmatic sensible things that under North Dakota smart that you can do uh, if you're a grocery store uh, other states have instituted 
uh, executive orders. Uh, we're not prepared to do that because we think that North Dakotans are smart enough to, whether it's having your employees wear masks, uh, whether it's the people stocking shelves wear gloves, whether it's uh, you know putting tape on the ground uh, in the checkout line so people stay more than six feet away from each other, uh, the plexiglass that's gone up at some of the checkout lines, uh, picking up orders. There's hundreds and hundreds of things uh, that could never be encompassed in an executive order that we as smart North Dakotans can go out and do. So if you're one of the lucky few that is still operating a business today and you're still open and it's deemed an essential business, please do everything that you can uh, to modify your standard operating procedures to protect your employees and the public. This is more effective. Uh, again, this is about you know individual responsibility means uh, you know employees speaking up if they think they're at risk. It means business owners looking after their team members. It means customers giving feedback, uh, and it means everybody doing their part to to minimize travel and stay at home wherever possible. One other thing which we've talked about before is is uh, it's still we know a lot of people have been tested and and they're getting tested in many cases because they're symptomatic. But if you're not feeling well, uh, you know, stay home. If you have family members that are sick, stay home. Uh, there's a lot of pragmatic uh, things here. Just if you're, if you're not feeling well, do not go to work. Uh, that can be one of the number one things we can do to slow the spread is to have the people that are not, that are not feeling well uh, participate in this. And as I've said before, I, I will use every tool at my disposal and all the powers that are granted to me as governor uh, to help protect the health and the safety of the citizens of North Dakota. Uh, but for those that are, you know, that are putting uh, uh, out, you know, calls for us to do more, I encourage them to look at the data we're sharing today and know that when it makes sense, we'll take those steps, and if it makes sense, we'll take those steps. But in our judgment as of today, uh, what we're doing, plus the two new executive orders you're gonna hear about in a minute, uh, put us on that path towards uh, pragmatic uh, steps uh, to slow the spread while we continue to build and expand our hospital capacity. Uh, to that end, uh, today, uh, we are going to sign an executive order today, uh, which is going to require individuals who test positive for COVID-19 uh, to self-quarantine. This would be if they're, you know, because again, only a fraction of those people who test positive end up hospitalized. But if you're tested COVID-19, uh, it would seem to be make complete common sense that you'd be self-isolating. This is what we've been asking for, but now we're turning this into an executive order, uh, and this will be tied into uh, uh, directives uh, coming from the uh, powers invested in our state health officer. But if you've got COVID-19, you need to quarantine. If you've tested positive, quarantine for no less than 14 days. And we say no less because maybe it's gonna be longer than that based on your individual situation. But now here's the other part, which you've heard us say. If you're a family member or another individual living in the same housing situation, the same household, if you're living with someone who has tested positive, you are also ordered by this executive order to self-quarantine for a period of no less than 14 days from the date of the positive test or unless directed otherwise by the state health officer. Self-quarantining of those people who test positive and those who are in direct contact with those people who have tested positive is the least restrictive and the most practical and most effective way of separating individuals who are known to be contagious or exposed to COVID-19. Uh, and it's the most effective way to protect those that are unexposed, susceptible or vulnerable individuals. So we, again, uh, have been thanking people for their cooperation during this time uh, when we've offered this as guidance uh, and we extend our gratitude to all those uh, who understand that uh, that you're being a hero. If you're living with someone who's tested positive for COVID and you're undergoing that quarantine with them, uh, we say thank you to you because your actions uh, to stay home, stay quarantined, uh, clearly has the opportunity to, to save lives. It should be noted that uh, while this may seem uh, restrictive, we had uh, some time ago already put in the 14 day self quarantine for citizens returning from states on the CDC's widespread COVID list. And from our understanding, uh, that was a lot of people that were here uh, that were either coming here uh, for uh, summer labor, sometimes uh, from around the US, around the world, uh, you know, is an important part of our farm labor. It could have been people returning, uh, snowbirds returning from Florida, Arizona. We've heard a lot of a lot of uh, folks that are in that 
uh, in that category of the snowbirds that are uh, gladly doing this as they quarantine here. Even some of them I know uh, probably were self-quarantining in the states they were at before they came here, but we again are grateful for their collaboration and uh, cooperation. Uh, second uh, executive order, which I'll be signing today, uh, we're moving from guidance to an actual executive order suspending uh, visitation at long-term care facilities. This includes skilled nursing, basic care facilities. There are exceptions in this for end of life and compassionate care uh, circumstances, but all non-essential services provided in long-term care facilities uh, must also be discontinued until further notice. And this again is an obvious way uh, to move from, from guidance to an order, something we've been providing guidance on for some time, uh, but again, to try to protect our most you know, most elderly uh, and most vulnerable. There are many other states that have had deadly outbreaks in uh, nursing homes. There are other states uh, that have got, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of nursing homes that have already got COVID positive. Uh, so far, we've been uh, very uh, uh, fortunate here. Uh, so again, we know that the guidance that we'd provided that there was uh, high uh, compliance and we wanna thank uh, those family members. We know how difficult it is to not be visiting your loved ones, uh, but we would say, you know, amp up the cards, the letters, the, the Skype, the Zoom, the phone calls uh, to, to make sure that, well, we may not be able to see them physically, that those, of our, those that are most vulnerable in the state know how much we care about them. And by putting this order in place, uh, we do this because we're trying uh, to save lives. We also uh, do this uh, with the full support of the Long-Term Care Association of North Dakota. And we thank them for their collaboration uh, as we've worked through this, this health uh, crisis. Uh, this is also consistent with the American Healthcare Association recommendation and, and the, our State Department of Health uh, as well. They have continued to support these kinds of actions as well. Uh, and so we appreciate the unanimous support for this action. And we will continue to take targeted actions uh, and review those opportunities uh, around the clock and every day, things we can do to slow the spread of COVID-19 and protect those that are most vulnerable. Uh, next topic, I wanna give an update on uh, you know, the very exciting uh, project that we were able to conduct on Saturday and Sunday. And let me just start out with a thank you to all the folks from our Department of Health, uh, those uh, folks from the National Guard that were part of this assignment, uh, all the people that planned it and executed it, uh, and, uh, and all the people from the local health departments that were there supporting it. But our Operation uh, uh, Rural Drive-In Testing uh, was a success, uh, success so successful that it was oversubscribed. Uh, this is one of the first uh, in the country. Uh, and again, credit to uh, everybody at the state lab and everybody working on logistics. This would not have been possible if we had not been able to build up our testing capacity to where we could continue to test all the people who are presenting as symptomatic at our health facilities around the state and have the extra capacity to be able to go out and try to do some surveillance testing in two targeted areas. And we've been asked, why did you pick these two areas? Well, when we picked Slope County, uh, we, were, we had a county that had had zero tests uh, and zero positives, a large county uh, with, uh, you know, very uh, low population uh, per square mile, uh, one of the most rural counties in the nation. Uh, but time, between when we picked it and when we were announced we we're gonna execute it, we had our first positive, uh, but we were still going into a largely untouched part of the country, which was part of the, uh, the testing criteria. And we did have uh, 367 uh, samples that were collected. Originally, the testing was gonna go from 10 till two. It went from 10 till 4.30 uh, because of the huge turnout uh, I believe as early as 1.30, uh, we had to start notifying people that were in line. We had a line of cars from the, uh, you know, winding from the Amadon Fairgrounds uh, in through the in through the town of Amadon, and want to apologize uh, to those people that came and waited and were turned away because we didn't have enough tests. But we uh, tested a lot more than we thought were going to show up. So again, uh, good feedback for us that there is widespread interest uh, in in these uh, drive-through testing, uh, and 367 samples, most of those collected from Slope County uh, citizens in a county that's got about 750 people, will give us a really good statistical sample of of uh, in lens of what's going on there. Uh, 
some of those samples made it into today's count. Uh, we're going to have a full account by Wednesday of the of the testing from both the, the Gladstone, North Dakota uh, Fire District and the uh, the Slope County uh, area. Again, want to give a shout out to Slope County Emergency Manager, Slope County Commission, uh, and uh, the Slope County uh, Fairgrounds Board and everybody locally that helped uh, make this thing uh, possible. Uh, and, and again, uh, uh, I think very positive. One of the things that this also allows us to do uh, when we collect these is to us to be able to validate, uh, which we have been able to confirm that the oral swab testing that we were doing on Saturday is working on the new, the new large uh, high throughput uh, Abbott 2000, uh, M2000 Abbott machines. We received two of those uh, last week. Uh, we were one of the few states in the country to get an allocation of those uh, and excited to see those up and running and helping drive this. On Sunday, April 5th, the second drive up test was held in Gladstone, North Dakota. And people might know that that's in Stark County, east of Dickinson. Uh, this is uh, Stark County uh, and Montreal County are the two counties that actually have got a higher percentage of positive cases per population uh, than even any of our other metro areas. So if we were going to say, you know, do we have any hot spots in North Dakota? Two places we've got our eye on is Stark County and Montreal County. Uh, they, uh, again, that was meant to go, uh, uh, you know, for, on uh, s Sunday afternoon, uh, and it went from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. 368 samples were collected on on Sunday. So the team, team uh, North Dakota collected 735 samples. It was free uh, for all participants. Uh, one of the things that we are uh, going to come up with this is because there was this little bit of screening is we're going to see if anyone who tested positive was someone who, who reported coming into that test that they had no symptoms, no fever, no cough, uh, no respiratory illness. Uh, we, we will, again, uh, help us get visibility, and this is data that could help really shape our models, uh, not just here in North Dakota, but the models of this country, uh, and we want to uh, continue to uh, try to identify that information. The faster we can identify for someone that's positive, so if someone is identified as asymptomatic, <clears throat> but they're positive, the quarantine order that we just announced still applies to them. Because this is probably where we've had some issues is where people are asymptomatic, meaning showing no symptoms, uh, but they're spreading it unwittingly. So again, that's a, a key thing that we have. Uh, and again, we were able to get 188 of those tests uh, from uh, Saturdays were, have been, been uh, uh, concluded. 94 of them made it into this morning's report. Uh, and uh, a public health lab announced that we'll have all these on, on Wednesday. Uh, so again, a great collaboration between local public health, Department of Health, North Dakota National Guard, local first responders. Want to give another shout out to uh, the community of Gladstone, the Gladstone Fire Department, Stark County Sheriff, uh, who also provided a bunch of support to make this, this happen. Uh, one of the things that I want to say, which has been undetermined, but I'm going to uh, th throw a... Uh, <clears throat> throw my own opinion in here about where we should go next. I uh, had conversations with uh, Mark, Chairman Mark Fox today and Dr. Monica Meyer. Uh, Dr. Mayer is uh, uh, the councilwoman for the north segment of, of MHA. Uh, she's the former uh, chief medical officer for the uh, five state region for Indian Health Service, uh, longtime emergency uh, doctor. Uh, Within uh, the Elbowoods Clinic uh, is a place where we have had uh, 12 positives out of 51 tests. So if you take a look at that, you know that's a situation where we would have a uh, through known you know known contact uh, through some of those individuals, but where we would consider that a hot spot. So I, I'm I'm proposing this is another area where we may, if we can get our capacity up and get our team mobilized to think about this. We had talked about uh, tribal areas as one of the test areas, and now we've got a potential hotspot that we can collaborate with the tribe. Of course, we'll do this uh, with the uh, with the support uh, and invitation of Chairman Fox if he invites us up there to do that. Uh, but we had another three-hour call on Friday night with all of the five tribal chairs from around the state. Uh, uh, 
State Health Officer Mylon Tufty, myself, uh, Scott Davis from Indian Affairs, uh, continuing to c collect valuable information about the unique challenges that we're facing in Indian country and want to work with our, our neighbors and our partners and those sovereign nations to make sure that we're uh, doing the very best in collaboration uh, to help support them as well. Uh, okay, on uh, next uh, topic <clears throat> uh, I want to talk about is uh, behavioral health. Uh, you know, there's a, you know, enormous focus on this virus right now, and the virus is about physical health, but we have to understand that there's something else going on right now, which is, again, uh, with the kind of isolation, with the disruption, uh, whether it's, you know, kids not seeing their schoolmates, whether it's uh, parents uh, breaking out of a routine. If you've been someone who's gone to work faithfully for the last 30 years and now you're not going into work, if you're someone who's recently been laid off, if you're a small business owner and you're wondering uh, about your, your financial concerns and how you're going to, your business is closed. Uh, if you're a farmer that was already under enormous stress uh, because of last fall's flooding, uh, let's just say we know that the amount of stress hitting the people of our state probably has never been higher. If there was a stressometer, you know, that was showing the dial, it would be uh, at levels we haven't seen. And we have to understand that stress is a directly related to health issues. So taking active measures to try to reduce your stress, whether that's exercise, whether it's meditation, whether it's connecting with family, uh, whether it's uh, you know fresh air and outdoor activities, whether it's more sleep, whether it's being more kind uh, to yourself and creating space for some self-care, all these things that we may not be used to be doing in a in a world that was North Dakota tough, we've talked about you know people that get up and go to work for 50, 60 years, no matter how they feel, doesn't matter. I feel bad. I got to go do my work. That's part of what's been core to our culture. But to get through this pandemic, it's an opportunity for all of us to learn uh, new approaches. There is a national distress helpline. Uh, we're showing the number here, uh, the 1 800 number. Uh, you can text to talk with us uh, at a specific number. That's being shown, disaster distress. Uh, website. Uh, we're going to push all this out here. This is a national resource that was created uh, in 2012 following Katrina. Uh, it's been used, uh, you know, everything from uh, uh, rolled out with a lot of usage after the Boston, you know, bombing, after the uh, Ebola crisis, etc. But when you call this line, uh, you're going to get connected with uh, with counseling, trained counseling and support, uh, and those individuals that you're going to talk to. It's a network of crisis call centers across the country where the calls get routed. And when you call or text, they're going to listen to what's on your mind. They're going to do it with patience. They're going to do it without judgment. You don't have to give any identifying information about who you are, where you live. Uh, but if you need somebody to talk to and you're sitting at home isolated, uh, even if you're just you know, concerned about what's going on, go ahead and call these, this disaster distress hotline there, there to help. Uh, next topic. Uh, this morning we had another, uh, we had a two hour call with all the governors of the United States and the vice president and all the, the leaders of the coronavirus task force, uh, whether it's a, a uh, Pete Gaynor from FEMA. Uh, we had the, the Admiral on, on there. We had uh, Dr. Bricks was on board on the call. Uh, Tre Secretary Treasurer Mnuchin was on board and uh, governors from around the state. And uh, you know the key messages from, from that call uh, are what we've already covered today, which is uh, asking all governors to reinforce the need uh, for us, uh, particularly during this time, uh, to follow all the guidance that we have. And for North Dakota, that means all the executive orders plus all the guidance under the North Dakota Smart, the stay home, stay healthy, stay connected uh, guidance that we're providing. Uh, another thing that they announced was that the, uh, that the federal government had purchased uh, 1,200 of the uh, Abbott ID Now machines. These are the machines that can do a test in less than 15 minutes. Uh, 15 of those are going to each state. Uh, so that's uh, fantastic uh, that they're distributing those uh, to the states. Uh, they're expected to arrive between April 7th and April 10th. Uh, they'd purchased 1,200. The other 450, which I'm happy to report, are going to Indian Health Services. So Indian Health Service will be receiving a, uh, nearly a third of that allocation or slightly more than a third of that allocation, which again uh, can filter through and be helpful to the tribes uh, in North Dakota. Uh, 
the, the other uh, topic from uh, Secretary Mnuchin, again, I would encourage uh, everybody out there, if you're a small business, a sole proprietor, uh, individual booth license owner, if you're a gig worker working from home, uh, and you may not think that some of the programs that were announced uh, in the CARES Act apply to you, but uh, we want everyone, again, this is an opportunity for, for self-responsibility, particularly if you're at home. We said on Friday that, the, that it was, this was on a first, curve, first serve, uh, you know, first come, first serve basis because maybe there's more funding coming later, but there's a cap on some of these things in the hundreds of billions of dollars, so there's still availability. But sh amazingly, uh, Secretary Mnuchin uh, said they went up on Friday, the SBA thing, $40 billion of applications have already been applied for and $60 billion of applications uh, were in process. So I can't stress enough uh, that if you're, uh, you know, feeling lost and not sure what to do and worrying about your business, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, get online, get on the SBA site, read the rules, figure out if it applies to you. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're not sure, read the frequently asked questions that are on the SBA site. Uh, if you still aren't sure, uh, check in with the North Dakota Commerce Department and see if we can help you. But start first with what's on the line and start filling out your application online. The SBA stuff touches over 50% of our nation's economy. And so, again, uh, really want people to, to uh, dive into there. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin also indicated that the direct payments uh, that are coming out, that those are going to start flowing uh, later in this month. Uh, and and you know, again, to those go to $1,200 to uh, you know, everyone who's uh, income qualified, meaning uh, you know, below $75,000 in annual income on your tax returns. Uh, there's higher amounts for couples that file together, but 1200 bucks for each adult, 500 bucks for each kid, family of four, that's $3,400. You don't have to do anything for that right now because uh, if you've been paying taxes, uh, you're gonna, you'll are gonna you be getting that check. If you haven't been, there's still a way to get to, to get a check. Uh, information will uh, keep coming on that. And then the unemployment uh, insurance, which we know uh, uh, continues to climb. Uh, we had another 2,787 unemployment cl claims uh, filed over the weekend. That brings the total to 37,000. 1,794 since March 16th. Uh, we're closing in on two years worth of unemployment claims in under three weeks. Uh, so that's uh, that. But the unemployment, the Secretary Mnuchin made the commitment again this morning that the federal government would make sure uh, that the money was there uh, to support that additional $600 a week uh, in federal uh, support. Uh, Seema Verma was on the call this morning, uh, who uh, leads uh, for the nation everything related to Medicare, Medicaid, and all the complicated rules that are there. They're complicated under regular times. Uh, but again, uh, as new guidance comes out, uh, there's lots of new flexibility. And this new flexibility might be something that cuts through red tape. And uh, some of us that are that would be opposed to bureaucracy and for uh, entrepreneurship uh, and flexibility and innovation would welcome uh, th some of this, uh, the, the silver lining of this crisis is uh, shedding some of that uh, bureaucratic cost, particularly when it comes to, uh, to healthcare in America. But hospitals uh, and nursing homes are, there's a concept that's included in the new rules called hospitals without walls, nursing homes without walls, meaning that if you need to provide care uh, to somebody uh, outside of your physical location, uh, let's say that you know somebody says, "Hey, you know, for you know, for we get in a step-down situation and we can't move them to a nursing home. Uh, we're going to move them to a uh, a dorm. We're going to move them to a hotel. We're going to provide care for them there. The hospital can bill for it, even though that activity is not happening within their walls. And so again, encouraging encouraging all of the healthcare providers in long-term care and in direct care uh, to really stay on top of every all the new rule changes because the opportunities for billing." Uh, in terms of how you get reimbursed for this are substantial. And of course, there was a uh, hundred uh, billion dollars in the CARES Act going direct to hospitals. And some of that includes, I know from the calls we've had that hospitals have said that they've got cash flow issues. Some of this allows uh, the new rules that are coming out that we heard about this morning would allow a hospital essentially to get prepaid or get an advance for three months of what their normal billing would be for federal. So that could be another injection of cash flow that keeps our healthcare system uh, rolling. So uh, 
I'd say to everybody uh, that's under economic stress, uh, we understand, we're empathetic. Uh, we also would encourage people to, uh, to take action. Uh, you, you always say control what you can and don't worry about the stuff you can't. One of the things you can control uh, if you're in healthcare or if you're in small business is to you can control the energy and the time that you put into understanding the new rules and getting your applications in uh, so to make sure that you're uh, working to the advantage of your team, your team members, uh, and to North Dakota to make sure that you're, if you qualify, that you're, you're getting all that support. Uh, with that, uh, that concludes uh, our formal uh, report, other than I want to share a word of gratitude again uh, for all the progress that made. I've been able to share gratitude for all the people that were involved in this weekend's uh, Operation drive through I want to say thanks to all of the uh, legislators around the state that keep providing us uh, input and guidance. Uh, I want to thank all the mayors that Brent and I, Brent and I uh, probably each spent 20 hours this weekend on phone calls uh, talking to uh, uh, local leaders. And again, a lot of great local leadership that's going on around the state. Thank you uh, to all the local leaders. And for the faith-based leaders, again, we know that uh, you know, yesterday was Palm Sunday. This is the beginning of Holy Week. Uh, we know this is a very tough time uh, for not to be together as a congregation, but for those of you that found a way to virtually hold services and stay connected and, and dealing with the spiritual needs of your congregations to be able to do that in a way where you weren't uh, in a congregate setting, we say thank you to all of you. Uh, and again, for all the frontline health workers around the state uh, that are taking care of patients, for all of the folks that are and family members that are supporting people that are sick and for all of you that are self-isolating whether you're snowbird coming back to North Dakota uh, or whether you're you're someone that has been self-isolating or someone that now falls under this order we say thank you to you we're grateful for your for your actions and everything you're doing collectively together we're helping to save lives in North Dakota so thank you all and now we'll stand for questions um, I'd like to go back to the number of beds that you mentioned there. Um, I'm just wondering how many of those 2,600 beds are normally taken up by people with non-COVID related illnesses and then is that 2,600 number aspirational at this point or is that the actual number we're operating with? Uh, the aspirational number is actually higher than that. Uh, we think that with uh, that we can get substantially higher than 2,600. Uh, with what we call the you know the surge capability, uh, and that would be uh, you know adding um, or converting uh, facilities that may have been closed uh, in the last uh, couple of years uh, that we could reopen those whether it's a floor whether it's a building in a hospital system, uh, but we could get uh, substantially higher than that. That number does not include uh, any of the field hospital. Uh, preliminary planning that's gone on, whether that's, you know, Fargo Dome or University of Mary or wherever it is, I mean, doesn't include any of that. Uh, license bed number uh, in North Dakota is actually higher than that. Uh, your question about how many are used uh, typically, uh, that number uh, is, uh, you know, is available through the hospital association through the reporting, but it's really not relevant right now because we've seen such a decline uh, in hospital usage, I mean, what we've got going, I mean, so many uh, cancellations of elective surgeries, uh, so many people opting uh, to not uh, go down. There's been demand destruction everywhere. Uh, not, I mean, when I say demand destruction, there's demand destruction for for gas and oil because people are driving less, but there's been demand destruction in healthcare. So we've probably never ever had as much available capacity as we do right now in healthcare because the, the, the number of beds that are unoccupied currently is dropping faster than the number of COVID patients that are coming in by a lot. And so to the point where we've even, uh, I'm sure we're gonna see in some cases before we even get to the peak, you might see uh, health organizations even furloughing or reducing staffing levels of some of their staff because uh, you know if you're not doing uh, you know if you're a surgical center and all you did was day surgery and you're not operating right now I mean that's freeing up staff it frees up capacity do you know the latest number on the number of unoccupied beds uh, don't don't know the latest number but it's um, let's just say we got plenty of space right now we're moving towards getting all of that you know automated as part of our systems because we want to be able to have essentially a uh, 
air traffic control tower where we know where's, where everything's available, where it's available in the state, uh, and we want to, you know, get, if we, like, ideally we'd get to on, online real-time reporting on all this information, uh, and that's part of what the hospital surge task force is working on. Uh, one of the action items over the weekend is we've got to add some IT people to that uh, from a, IT from a data collection standpoint so we can track all this. Uh, Dave Thompson and then to Jacob. You mentioned about first come first serve about some of the benefits from the CARES Act. A, do you think eventually the money will run out? And B, if it does, do we need a second CARES Act? Uh, will the money run out? Uh, I, I think demand will exceed supply in terms of what the uh, federal government has uh, put into those plans. Uh, it's, and I and I think that the mood of the country right now is that there will be a fourth stimulus bill and some of that may include components that weren't covered and some of it may include additional dollars getting behind programs that are working. Is there anything that you'd like to see in the fourth stimulus bill that is not in the, the previous three? Well, there's, you know, entire industry segments that were left out uh, and, and, you know, understanding uh, that you know, how, how critical, you know, industries are. It was great that airlines were covered. I mean, that's strategic, but, you know, when I take a look at the energy industry uh, and how critical that is to the recovery of this, of this country, that's one that I, uh, I think would need to be there. I think we're going to have to take a, uh, you know, special look at agriculture as well uh, in terms of, of how that may, you know, may have disrupted their uh, supply chains and markets. Uh, but I, I think those are, you know, two industries that really weren't touched by the first three rounds. Jacob? Uh, Governor, when you talk to other governors and the vice president when discussing how to reinforce uh, a lot of the social distancing initiatives, uh, is there ever a point where the public can't necessarily be trusted to enact social distancing policies and you have to expand those orders? Uh, I think that what's missing for every governor is the uh, actual data on whether distancing is occurring. I mean, you can compare side by side, you know, here's a stay at home order, here's a shelter in place order, uh, here's uh, business closure restrictions uh, with executive orders and guidance. I mean, there's, a, there, it, and, it, and one of the great things about our nation is that we've got 50 states and that we've got 50 platforms of innovation. And when we get, and when we get done with this thing, we're gonna be able to look back and say, you know, maybe after the fact, what worked and what didn't versus, you know, and I think it's a beautiful thing. I mean, some people are calling for, you know, a federal response to everything. And this flies in the face of, uh, you know, the understanding of, of your own local demographic situations. It flies in the face of, uh, you know, uh, understanding local capability. It, 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 it flies in the face of, of uh, culture. Uh, you know, I mean, what's, you know, what's needed in Alaska where, uh, I mean, the governor was on the call this morning reminding people that he's got some communities that are, you know, 500 plus miles away from the next community and there's no road between them. I mean, those needs are, you know, they're, they're di different. You know, tribal communities have different needs than non-tribal communities. So, I mean, it's like one of the beautiful things is that we've got, you know, every governor in the nation cares deeply about their people and every governor is acting in the best interest of their people. Uh, the fact, I, I'm, I am really uh, thrilled that we have a approach which is um, state managed, locally executed, federally supported. You know, that is said on every call that we have with the uh, president and vice president. State managed, locally executed, federally supported. Uh, it's not the federal government's job to take care of every, you know, you know, make sure that, you know, every playground in the nation is, doesn't have more than 10 people in it. Uh, and it would be impossible for them to try to do that. So I think this, the balance uh, and the beauty of America is partly the way that we're set up right now. And I think that we're uniquely suited to, 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 to use innovation to try to get through this. So uh, I think what's missing on this question, because you can compare what the states have done, but you can't actually compare whether they're working. Because uh, someone can have a stay at home order with a list of exceptions that's so long that it's actually meaningless because everything is essential. Uh, or someone else, uh, you know, in North Dakota where we may have uh, a less restrictive so far 
on it, but we may actually have higher compliance. I mean, uh, we're going to be releasing going ahead uh, more data that we're collecting from DOT. We've got 77 sites around the state where we're collecting traffic data. We have some places where we're down 50 percent you know, over 50% of traffic. I mean, you know, that's, and if you think that healthcare and agriculture and energy are all essential, in, you know, industries, and those are our three biggest industries in the state and traffic's down 50%, I would say the vast majority, I don't know what the number is, but the vast majority of North Dakotans are ably and earnestly and with care in their hearts complying with what we're asking. You know, we're always going to get anecdotal information, you know, on social media that, hey, there was a, you know, house party here and somebody had church there. But I think, you know, for the vast majority of the state, we're everybody, we got people complying. But we're asking people to take it even more seriously, particularly in the weeks ahead. This is when we can really make a difference on keeping that curve flat in the, in the next few weeks. Follow up on that then, since uh, we don't necessarily have the data to know whether or not social distancing is working, what data do you rely on to see how other states are responding and if they're successful? Well, I think that the data that we do have is the stuff we led our, with today, which is what's our percent of positives and how are we doing on testing. And, and if we can continue to lead the nation in you know, being in the top 10 of people that are getting tests done per capita and have the lowest uh, positive rate, then you'd have to say, hey, we're, you know, if we have a low positive rate, that means that the thing is not spreading. The other thing we look at is, you know, hospital capacity. All the all the the restrictions to slow the spread, the, the strategy behind restricting, uh, you know, activity and business and travel and contact is to preserve hospital capacity. And as we said, right now we've got enormous hospital capacity. So, against the strategy that we're we're operating against, that's the data. The data is, you know, net new hospitalizations you know, is net new, meaning how many are coming in versus how many are leaving, how much can we grow our hospital capacity to, and what's the positive positive growth. Those, those are things that we're absolutely looking at. Cases per day, uh, you know, we could have more cases per day than someone else, uh, but if we're doing twice as much testing, that's not really meaningful. We got to look at tests per capita uh, and positives per capita uh, to, really, to really compare those numbers uh, state to state. You know, because if we, if we have more positives in another state, but we've done twice as much testing as they have, then that's, that doesn't mean much. That's sort of the follow-up to that. Um, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking here that, that you know, this is a, during a pandemic is when, uh, you know, for all of us that hated statistics, uh, you know, maybe you wish that everybody would have taken like three more classes, but uh, actually I didn't hate statistics. You guys probably know that, but I, <laughs> I'm a... Uh, Everybody knows that. But anyway, we are just saying that uh, neither is Brent. Brent loved it. I think he got an A-plus in statistics. But anyway, we are, uh, we, we are, uh, it is, it, there's, there's, there's certainly math to epidemics. And, and one of the things that you're seeing, uh, was talked about this morning on the call, uh, in Europe uh, with Spain and Italy starting to show some decline in their growth rates of, of you know, deaths and new cases. When that's happening, that's influencing the models in the United States. I mean, some of the some of the inability to predict predict in the U.S. was that in Western democracies, because you kind of had to toss out South Korea and China, uh, because they had different abilities to lock down, lock down and control how they were managing it. But if you look at Spain and Italy, as more parallel from a. Uh, a Western demographic, Western democracy approach uh, to it, uh, and, and yes, there's differences in, in demographics because Northern Italy there was an older population with a higher degree of underlying health issues. You have to factor all that out. But now that those curves are starting to flatten a little bit, uh, that will start to influence some of the models in the U.S. because we'll, we'll, we've got a lens looking ahead of when that curve would come down. Lane, and then we'll go to online. Governor, you mentioned earlier that uh, some people have reached out to you to put more restrictive measures in order. There is an online petition right now with over 4,000 people suggesting that North Dakota goes into a lockdown. Your thoughts on that? Well, uh, aware of that, and uh, there's no way of sorting how many of those people live in North Dakota. I know there's been a lot of out-of-state pressure uh, based on uh, you know, information that's floating around that may uh, not understand uh, that North Dakota was one of the ones that moved early. I mean, I, I don't know, find another state that closed their schools after they had one positive case, that was North Dakota. I mean, we moved early and fast on a number of restrictions uh, that, is, that is producing this low positive rate today, and we've moved fast on increasing our testing. So uh, I feel comfortable where we are, 
you know, North Dakota's got 760,000 people. Even if 100% of those people were in North Dakota, uh, that would mean that less than close to, you know, one half of 1% of North Dakotans uh, signed that petition. Uh, I, I think, you know, so anyway, we, you know, we, we listen, you know, we get to listen to every, both sides. We get to listen to people that think we've locked down too much and people that think we need to lock down more. But we would invite uh, those people that have signed that petition to uh, really dig into the numbers with us, be curious about what we've done, uh, and try to understand that what we're, what the problem we're trying to solve, and the problem we're trying to solve is to make sure that we save lives. We save lives by slowing the spread and staying under our healthcare capacity line, and we're doing exactly that. So if they've got suggestions about how we can do that better, uh, we wanna hear that, but uh, the label the label on top, I mean, a quote, you know, stay at home order, you know, they go read other state stay at home orders and read the list of exceptions uh, and, 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 uh, and compare those things. I mean, it takes a complex problems are not solved with labels. They're solved by a deep understanding of the complexity and it involves a lot of nuance underneath it. And so uh, just, I, I, you know, I appreciate the passion, the, con the connection. I appreciate everybody on social media with the feedback. We welcome, we welcome hearing people's opinions, but uh, our job is to look at the data and listen, listen to all sides. So we're going to keep listening to that. And uh, what we hear on social media will be uh, one piece of that feedback. From online. Jean Shemp with Hometown Radio Group in Minot and Botano. What is the penalty for people who do not follow the quarantine order uh, that you talked about today uh, and for those in household, household who might not follow that? I'm going to do ask, uh, what they, was they called? Ask a friend. I didn't watch much TV growing up, but I'm, uh, or even in life, but is there, is this, is this a, uh, uh, State Health Officer Mylan Tufty says Class B misdemeanor up to $1,500 fine, and that's enforced locally. Another question online. Robin Travers with 660 KEYZ in Williston. Are there any plans in North Dakota to enforce the use of masks in public areas such as grocery stores? Uh, question from Robin about enforcing use of masks. Not at this time. Uh, I think as people know, the CDC has uh, recommended this. There's uh, videos online. I think the CDC, the Surgeon General have got things. If you don't have a mask, you know, here's how you make one out of a handkerchief or a t-shirt. Uh, I think that people should, uh, if they want to follow CDC guidance, they should do this. We know that uh, many local uh, cities are, are taking this action, say with bus drivers, driving public transportation. Uh, you know, masks are a good idea to slow the spread. It's a, it's a uh, good idea. So if you're in a spot where you think you're going to have close contact with people, uh, if I was working as a checkout clerk uh, at a grocery store, I'd be wearing one. Uh, and so I think, again, it, it's a situational. Uh, wouldn't need to be wearing one at home if you're within your own pod of people. You don't need to be wearing one if you're walking in the park and there's no one within a thousand feet of you. If you're a farmer, uh, rancher going out uh, by yourself to do your work and only seeing family members, uh, you know, again, it's it's it, the spread that we're trying to prevent is under six feet. So if you find yourself in a position where you're within six feet of a lot of a strangers as part of your work or part of your day, mask would be a good uh, a good additional secondary measure. Uh, and even if you're healthy, it's a good idea. It helps protect you, but you may be asymptomatic. It would stop you from spreading. So uh, masks are another tool. But uh, we, uh, you know, you order. 760,000 people to wear a mask, uh, all we'll do is create a shortage of masks and then the people that might really need to wear them uh, aren't getting them. So again, we're trying to be, again, under this individual responsibility. If you're one of those people that you think you might be spreading or think you're at risk, uh, do it. If you're one of the people that's not within six feet of people during, because you're working from home, you're with your family, um, you don't have to do it. So, so we're, you know, the, We've all been given the ability, we talk about individual responsibility, but uh, during this period of time, this is a chance to, for us to exercise your own judgment. And, and again, I, we support people, uh, people wearing masks. There should be no stigma around that. If you see somebody wearing a mask, the first thing you might say to them is thank you because they might be, they might be protecting you as well as themselves. Um, a follow-up to, I think, Jacob's question. Um, do you think a stay-at-home order in North Dakota would improve social distancing? And let's take Minnesota's um, order in, in this case just for the purposes of this question. Uh, we're not uh, – the qu question is a hypothetical one. Do we think it would improve compliance? 
Uh, there's no data that, that shows that, that places with stay-at-home orders are having less transmissible contact than, than states without them. I mean, because there's no way to show that there are fewer people within six feet of each other uh, in a state that has a stay-at-home order than there are people that, that don't. Uh, I think there's a presumption that there is, uh, but there's no data that would support that. And, and so you're, uh, and, and again, if you're in a, uh, you know, large metro area with, uh, where a huge portion of the population might be using public transportation, uh, and you've got rates of, you know, these rates of positive testing north of 40%, you know, then you'd be like, wow, that is a, uh, that, that's a tool that we need to go to. But when you're at, in a state that's got 11 people per square mile and, and 3% rate, uh, and a high degree of compliance with the guidance that we have, uh, you know, again, I, you know, in some kind of <clears throat> a, uh, big brother mission impossible world where you could track every contact with every other person, you know, we might show that, that we're having less transmissible moments of under six feet than, than, you know, my, in the States, I would love, I'd love to have that rank because if, if, uh, then you'd be like, okay, wow, we're not doing well on, reducing transmissional moments, we got to do other things. But as soon as you put one of those orders in, then you have to define what's essential or not essential. And the talking to every other governor that's done that, I mean, if you don't have that list, then why put an order in? Because, and then if you say, well, we're going to concede to everybody that they're all, everybody's essential, then you've effectively done nothing but a kind of a feel good, check the box thing. And we're actually interested in doing things that actually work as opposed to uh, just checking the boxes. Uh, we'll go online and then back to Lane. Eric Art with KZZY in Devil's Lake. Is there any update on the potential plan you had mentioned last week to set up a system making hand sanitizer more widely available? Uh, Eric asking about the uh, hand sanitizer. Uh, I know that production of hand sanitizer is progressing. I think I said last week that it was uh, being done by distilleries, and I've heard since then that there may be some ethanol plants that are getting involved. Uh, looking around, is that True, not true, we don't know. Uh, okay, now I'm spitballing. That's what they tell me not to do from up here. So we're, uh, uh, we'll get back, Eric, we'll get back to you on that one. We'll maybe have an update. We can have an update tomorrow on uh, the mass production of hand sanitizer. But again, the same thing, uh, what we, same guidance we gave last time. If you have an empty bottle, uh, pump bottle from hand sanitizer, hang on to it and so that, because uh, we'll have hand, san we'll have a lot, of, could have a lot of hand sanitizer, but no dispensers to put it in. So save yours at home. Lane Hinkins. Governor, a lot of states are vying for medical supplies right now. Has North Dakota had any troubles getting those? Uh, no, we haven't. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's been shared that we, we shared some masks with Montana to help them out. Uh, we had a, a, a South Dakota lent us an extractor uh, for a period of time, uh, which we'll get back to them if we need an extractor as a component that goes on to a testing machine in the lab that allowed, uh, they, they had a spare and one of ours is broken. Uh, we had a call on, on Saturday uh, with uh, Governor uh, Mark Gordon from Wyoming, uh, Steve Bullock from Montana, and Christine Ohm and myself, just the four of us on the call. Uh, and we agreed. Uh, again, I want to say, like, uh, I get a little emotional. I think about my hometown. I think about, you know, growing up in a town like Arthur, you know, if, if somebody during harvest, you know, had a heart attack, all the neighbors came and, and helped make sure that they uh, got that, got everything harvested, took care of it, you know, checked on their family, did all that stuff. This has been going on in North Dakota since statehood. Uh, neighbors helping neighbors. I mean, uh, you know, tribal culture in North Dakota is about more about, about giving than receiving. I mean, so we've got a deep heritage in our state uh, that supports that. And I think it was terrific uh, to be on the phone with uh, our neighbors, you know, Montana, Wyoming, and South Dakota, three states that I hold in high regard, uh, three beautiful states, three beautiful neighbors, uh, that they just, everybody on the phone, the governors are like, look, if we can help each other out uh, directly, uh, you know, we don't need to be, uh, you know, all, you know, waiting for the federal government to come when we can help each other out like neighbors in a small town did. And I think it's already happening and we'll continue to see that happening. And I, I think it's one another reason why it's great to be in this part of the world. If I can follow up on that. Um, over the weekend, I read a few articles from other states about the, um, them having 
low hospitalizations and sending ventilators out to New York since their hospitalizations are through the roof right now. Has North Dakota been a part of that or are thinking about doing that? We, ha we haven't uh, thought about doing that yet because one of the areas where we're probably a little tighter is on ventilators. We've got way more beds and bed capacity than we've got ventilators. Uh, I know that the state of Washington had received uh, a number of ventilators, like 400 from the national stockpile, didn't need them uh, because they had flattened their curve and sent them back. Uh, uh, the Oregon had sent 150 that they didn't need because their peak didn't come as high. Uh, and I, I think that that was, um, you know, fantastic and great and wonderful that they're doing that. I think that it, particularly as we get uh, in-state production, like what's going on at Apario, if we find ourselves in a position where we can be a state that is managed uh, through this uh, in a way where we can help our neighbors, whether it's uh, you know Minnesota or or any other state, uh, we'll be certainly you know happy to do that. And we'll and I think as it's been the past, North Dakotans have always uh, stepped up to try to help other people. We'll certainly do that if we got the capacity to do it. Another question online. Scott Hennon with WZFG KFYR Radio. Uh, how will the data from Amazon and Gladstone be used to shape the North Dakota response going forward, and how many additional drive-through testing operations do you anticipate? Uh, Scott, thanks for the question. On the how it'll be used uh, is, in particular, if we can identify uh, people in those populations. Again, I think we did uh, 367 about approximately at each of those locations. Uh, if we can identify people that, that came through the drive-through and when they did the screening said, you know, have you had a cough? No. Have you had a fever? No. Have you had any aches or pains? No. Uh, have you had, uh, you know, runny nose? No. I mean, if they're asympt have no symptomatics no, or asymptomatic, no symptoms, come back positive, that's going to be really valuable information because we had not been testing anybody in North Dakota prior to this. We'd been testing people that, you know, I, I suppose the exception might have been some uh, frontline medical workers who had been exposed to a positive that we tested to see if they would contracted it. So if they didn't, they could get back to work as opposed to 14 days of isolation. But in general, we hadn't done any community surveillance to identify whether or not uh, people were uh, had you know people were positive that had no symptoms so if we can get a baseline and say wow in a population of of 367 tests coming out of a county with 750 people and we found a half a dozen people that were positive that had no symptoms and we can quarantine those people and quarantine those people with the people that they had close contact with their household members you know then we could like stop and it's track an outbreak within that area which then saves us all kinds of PPE and saves us hospital beds it saves us you know all kinds of stuff so that was one and if we and, and, and again because there's been such a shortage of testing supplies in the country the two tests on Friday and Saturday are among the first in the country going into an area that had like like Slope County with almost no reports of COVID and then doing that scale of testing as a percent of population. Uh, and with, with uh, Gladstone being so close to uh, Dickinson and Stark County being one of our, our hotspots in terms of cases per thousand, uh, again, that was us just trying to again understand maybe what the reach and the spread might have been there. So both of those will feed into our models and help us more accurately shape the models uh, that we have uh, going forward. Is there a second part of that question, or did I cover it for Scott? I think you covered it. Okay. Uh, I have another one. Okay, another one coming in online. Dave Kolpak with the AP in Fargo. Would you say that the calls for North Dakota to be more restrictive are coming more from out of state or in state? Uh, Dave, uh, good question. I don't have explicit percentages on that. Uh, we're we're trying, in some cases on social media, you can't tell uh, if someone signed the position you know, the petition where they're, uh, where they're from uh, or not. Uh, we know that uh, some of the calls that we're getting based on the area codes, uh, they're coming into the governor's office are not 701 area codes. So we know that we're getting out of state calls on that. So we're, we're trying to filter those out and trying to really uh, understand, uh, you know, who and why, who and why people are calling. And again, uh, we, we found that when people actually understand all the restrictions we have in place, all the work that we're doing and everything that's going on, then uh, they, they, there's a general understanding. And so usually it's, uh, if, 
again, but we don't have time to talk to every single person uh, that's calling. But when we've had a chance to, if we've got, you know, if we've got a mayor, we've got, a, you know, the doctor from Eastern Montana calls and Brent and some people call him back. He's like, oh, I didn't realize that your thing was so restrictive. You guys are okay. I read online you guys were, you know, no, no, we, we've got a lot of things in place that even some of our neighbors don't. So we're, we're uh, it's again, it's a job for us to keep educating uh, and get the, get the word out. But to Dave, I don't know how many are in-state or out-state. If you know, let us know. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> okay, we're winding down. Uh, we got one over here and then back to you, Lane. Uh, University of Mary in the Fargo Dome. But do you think any other sites could emerge as, as tier three sites? Uh, we had identified, uh, I think, 10 uh, potential sites or the Army Corps of Engineers were here. They. They, and they, I know that our team, uh, General Dorman, has got the list of those sites. I saw them in a draft plan uh, this weekend. Uh, you know, our fervent hope, I mean, we're going to plan and plan and we're going to plan that. Our fervent hope is that no North Dakotan ever has to step into one of those sites and we don't have to staff them. And if we are smart on executing against the, the you know, stay home, stay healthy, stay connected on the be smart approach, and if we're... Uh, great at doing our surge capacity within buildings, taking that available capacity within the hospitals and building that up. Uh, we should have enough so we never have to get there. But we said at day one, we're gonna prepare for the worst and, and execute for the best. And, and preparing for the worst includes uh, having to have uh, these minimal care facilities. I mean, you know, no one's gonna be on a ventilator uh, in a University of Mary Gymnasium. I mean, we're not going to be able to deliver that kind of care. But if we get to that level, you know, you could be staffed by, you know, volunteers almost. Uh, it could be people that are on a, you know, step down. But we're hoping that we don't ever get to that level of of need. Uh, and the way we say we hope, we're planning to never get to that need. We're, and the way we do that is, you know, is the way we stay away from that is everybody in North Dakota following the guidance, following the orders with compliance uh, that we've given about staying home, staying healthy, staying connected. If, you, if we do all that, we should never need to set foot in there. But we'll keep, we'll, we, we, it's our job to, to do prepare for the worst, so we'll keep doing that as well. Lane, Danny, then those are our last two. Uh, Thomas Simon with Willesden Trending Topics. The health department says they have 13 ventilators in Williams County and none in McKenzie. What is the state doing to ensure a surge in Western North Dakota has the resources, including ventilators, to handle a surge in the next two, three to four weeks? Uh, Thomas, what we're doing is uh, this comprehensive hospital surge planning, the surge planning effort, that team that's working with the private sector with the with our team from the state of North Dakota uh, includes uh, equipment and staffing and equipment includes ventilators and PPE and beds it's all those things and so we're going to make sure uh, that we we have that we also as part of that plan uh, there's a transportation component uh, which is either we have to move more resources to where the surge is occurring or we got to move the patients to where we've got the resources uh, and that's going to include uh, close collaboration with all the EMS services in North Dakota who typically uh, are involved in transporting patients but if we have to expand capacity during a surge for more transportation again that's where the National Guard can uh, potentially step in uh, as part of providing that transportation but yeah every component is being thought of in that surge planning effort. Lane. In reference to your uh, executive order restricting visits to uh, long-term care nursing homes, uh, there was two exceptions listed on there, end of life, which is pretty self-explanatory, and compassionate care. What would be defined as compassionate care? Uh, Mylynn, do you want to offer that, or should we refer people to a website for the expl explicit definition? They should talk to their facility that they're, they're going to. Okay, the answer is talk to talk to their specific facility. But uh, good question uh, from Lane at KX News, and we'll get the clarification because we want to make sure that we're not using words that are confusing. So thanks for pointing that out. We will uh, we'll make sure we get a definition out there of what that means in our order. Okay, uh, with that, I want to go back uh, to again uh, gratitude this time to uh, all the 
uh, the press corps that has been faithfully showing up and to all the uh, people that are that are showing up online and asking questions online, uh, your role in helping get accurate, timely information to the state of North Dakota is critical during this crisis, and we're deeply appreciative of each of you uh, being here and being part of this. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow at 3.30, and to everybody that is uh, watching online, uh, you're doing your part uh, to help get valuable information out that helps protect you, your family, and your community. Uh, Anybody who's watching, you're a hero to us. So uh, North Dakota Smart, stay healthy, stay home, stay connected. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. See you tomorrow.